the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord, all you nations. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior for humanity were revealed, it was not because of any upright actions we had done for ourselves, it was for no reason except His own faithful love. That He saved us by means of the cleansing water of rebirth and renewal in the Holy Spirit. Which He so has so generously poured over us through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that justified by His grace we should become heirs in hope of eternal life. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Holy Father, we thank you for St. Paul and the letters that we that he wrote and that we can study. Thank you, Lord, for this letter to Titus that we are going to dive into today. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds to understand your word and lighten us through your Holy Spirit so that you empower us through your word to live a life of virtue so that we can upbuild the church and be a witness to the world. We make this prayer to Christ our Lord. St. Timothy, St. Titus, St. Paul, Apostle of the Gentiles, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's likely that Titus was written before 2 Timothy, as, as 2 Timothy is quite clearly, uh, if it is authentically written by Paul, his last letter, uh, as his death is impending. Uh, so this letter is uh, of an earlier date. You can also, you can see that they are very, um, that the pastoral letters are very closely related because uh, of the topic, uh, especially the topic of appointing elders and protecting the church from the influence of false witnesses and, and the, the protection of uh, the passing on of the deposit of faith uh, of the apostolic teaching. So the letter of Titus was probably written uh, uh, after uh, Paul's first Roman imprisonment so somewhere 63, 67 AD, somewhere, uh, and probably uh, in, in Nicopolis of Macedonia. Titus was a Gentile disciple of Paul. He was a convert as the Paul was continued to preach the gospel, and Titus at some point came to the faith. He was a Gentile, and um, Paul brings him along to the Council of Jerusalem uh, in Acts 15. And we don't see his name in Acts 15, but we see his name. We see that event uh, revealed in Galatians 2, verse 1 and 3. To 3 uh, uh, that Paul brings Titus along, who is a Gentile, because uh, the council, the, which in some sense is the first uh, uh, council of the church uh, in, in the, the Apostles' Council uh, in Jerusalem in, uh, in Acts 15, is uh, mainly resolves around the issue of should when when a gentile person comes to the faith should that person become a jew first or not and obviously uh, jesus is a jew jesus is the fulfillment of of the promises made to the people of god of of of, uh, of, of the, uh, the descendants of abraham the israelites and so and and and, and, and it's very clear even that in, in his own mission jesus is first and foremost be preaching to uh, the Jews, and even when, when there's one Gentile woman coming, he, he, he says, well, he even refers to her as a dog, and then it's because she said, well, but the dogs can also eat from the scraps that he, he sees her faith and is willing to minister to her. And so, in the early church, uh, even though, of course, after his resurrection and before his ascension, and the clear commission of Jesus is to go to the ends of the earth, uh, which means that uh, the, the faith is not restricted to Jews alone. Still, this is a discovery need to, that needs to develop within the early church because the first converts were all Jews. Uh, and so, only when, when the first Gentiles became Christian, 
and that became the question, should they, should they first become part of the Jewish people, which means that the men need to be circumcised and keep the law, uh, or can they become Christian straight away and um, and Paul in most of his letters re refers to this group of people called Judaizers uh, um, and so these were these Jewish Christians that were very much in favor of the opinion that you should become a Jew first and Paul uh, always argued the opposite and, and, and in the council of X15 uh, Paul's side wins uh, that, uh, uh, and we don't need to become Jews first we, we are not uh, bound by all the uh, 600 over uh, moral rules of the Jews of washing of hands of course the Ten Commandments still remain uh, uh, the law for all of us uh, but not all the detailed laws of the Jews of sacrifice because these are all the foreshadowing Christ now has come and, and we put our trust in and our faith in Jesus. Titus plays, uh, since he brings him along, he becomes uh, the model because he was a Gentile and they agree that he doesn't need to be circumcised. And so then Paul continues to argue that he is the model uh, and, and for, for all. No, nobody should have to be circumcised or become a Jew first. Compared to um, the letter to Titus, uh, Paul, uh, Titus is left in Crete, and so uh, he, he becomes the bishop of, of Crete, uh, the Greek island. Um, we, however, we don't, uh, we see it mentioned here, but uh, and no, in no other point of, of, of any other letters or of the Exodus Apostles do we see that Paul or Titus went to Crete, uh, but uh, uh, at some point they must have gone there and he has left uh, Titus there or sent him there. They are still very much in an early stage of development of the church, earlier than uh, we would have seen in Ephesus, uh, the letters uh, to Timothy. Timothy had, uh, was dealing already with a more maturing church, uh, um, whereas Titus is dealing with a very uh, young and emerging church and that's why he needs to go around and uh, appoint presbyters uh, in every town and that is his main task and so he needs to put the leadership structure in place there were a lot of Jews living in Crete um, which uh, maybe some Jewish missionaries uh, meaning Christian Jewish missionaries have gone there before uh, and, and some of the Jews would have already converted to Christianity. Um, however, it's unlikely that any other apostle would have gone to Crete because if so, then Paul would not assume authority. That was a kind of his rule, his policy, which we find in Romans 15 verse 20 that uh, Paul would only take apostolic charge over uh, communities that he himself founded. The, the issue uh, of, of, of the false teaching uh, and, and, and the problem in this letter is like in many of his other letters, these Judaizers that uh, will um, still say that you need to become Jew first. So although Paul addresses the letter to Titus personally, he knows that Titus will read it publicly, and just as the letters to Timothy would have also been written public, uh, would have been proclaimed publicly. Some of his listeners, especially if they have come from the early Jewish Christian communities in Palestine, may have some questions about either Paul's authority or that of Titus, who is, after all, a Gentile. That perhaps explains the rather long reading in which Paul asserts his apostolic authority, and we will see that uh, soon that uh, the introduction is quite long. I printed the structure of the uh, of the letter on, on, on a bigger page separately. Uh, um, quite a simple structure, uh, nothing much important. As, as in, sometimes structure in a letter or in, in a gospel reveals something about 
uh, what is important, some message. Uh, here it's a very, just a very simple uh, structure of the letter as we would find in Paul. So we will read in verse 1. Paul, a servant, uh, or, or actually the, the literally uh, a slave, uh, a slave of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that is in accordance with godliness, in the hope of eternal life that God who never lies pro promised before the ages began. In due time, he revealed his word through the proclamation which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. Actually, the verse, four verses, yeah, including the address to Titus, uh, is in Greek one sentence. Uh, but the first three verses uh, uh, is all about uh, the authority of Paul and uh, kind of a summary of his appointment. And then verse 4 is uh, the addressee. Uh, Paul, as he does in many of his other letters, is an apostle. Uh, and yeah, and last, yesterday, uh, last week uh, somebody came and asked, uh, uh, we talked about it, um, uh, why does Paul refer to himself as an apostle and uh, uh, how do we understand this term? Well, first, uh, to understand the apostle, uh, there were 12. Uh, there were the 12 apostles, uh, Jesus at some point, though he had many disciples, uh, uh, he, at some point he sends out the 12 and then he sends out the 72. So there were at least 72 uh, disciples and there were also many women following him um, who would take care of him. Uh, but not all of these 72 or more were called apostles. Uh, he specifically appointed 12 apostles. Uh, a little bit uh, like, like the ministers in the cabinet uh, of, of, of a government, uh, but not here of a, of, of a local government, but of a religious government. And so th they were his uh, representatives. And his, they had an official duty of re representing Christ and of proclaiming Christ and of bringing Christ forward. Uh, uh, the word apostle means basically send. Somebody who is sent. And it, and it is the same as the, it's the Greek word for what in, in, in Latin would have been a missionary. Somebody on a mission, somebody send. Uh, a disciple is a follower, an apostle is one being sent. Now, in a more general sense, uh, uh, all disciples are supposed to be apostles. Uh, all of us are supposed to be apostles in the sense that we too are sent on a mission. We too have a duty uh, and a right uh, to proclaim the good news. All of us are missionaries. I, I think I referred to that uh, last week in some of the apostolic teachings. Uh, you can also see it in, um, in the lift uh, summary of uh, Evangelii Gaudium, the, 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 the document of, the, of Pope Francis uh, in, in, in number 120. He, he refers to uh, all of us as missionary disciples. We are not supposed to just be followers in this, and then just be happy that I have a relationship with Christ and, uh, but it's just personal, it's just uh, private but I never share it with anybody else. No, we are missionary disciples. Following Christ includes uh, automatically uh, means that we also are sent to proclaim Christ. So in a more general sense uh, all of us are apostles, uh, but, but we don't refer to ourselves as apostles in, 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 in a title sense. Uh, the title uh, here first is the 12 apostles. In Acts 1, uh, after the ascension, uh, um, Judas, who has left the 12 uh, and, and hanged himself, uh, uh, the other 11 now decide that he needs to be replaced because uh, one of the scriptures says, uh, let someone else take his office. And so they, uh, they nominate two candidates, uh, Barsabas and um, Matthias. Yeah, and then in the end, Matthias was, uh, would appear to become one of the 12. And the criteria is uh, one of out of the men who have been with us the whole time that Jesus was living with us, from the time when John was baptizing until the day when he was taken up from us, one must be appointed to serve with us as a witness to his resurrection. And so uh, 
that was the criteria for filling uh, the place of um, Judas. One who would have known Christ personally, who had been in that journey, and from John the Baptist, uh, the time of, of John baptizing till his resurrection, um, somebody who is a personal witness, not from hearsay, not a second generation Christian, but uh, he has first hand knowledge of Christ. Now, to Paul, this doesn't apply because Paul wasn't there uh, from the time that John was baptizing. I mean, he was alive, but uh, he wasn't a follower. Uh, in fact, uh, he, he, he became uh, first uh, uh, the persecutor of the Christians. Uh, he was a, a staunch Pharisee uh, um, and, and wanted nothing to do with the people of the way and uh, the followers of Christ. But in X9, uh, when Paul goes to Damascus to persecute the Christians um, with a letter uh, from the authorities to even capture all those who are followers of the way, uh, um, Christ meets Paul. Uh, Christ reaches out to Saul and, and uh, he falls to the ground and he hears this voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he's persecuting the church, but Christ says, why are you persecuting me? Uh, Christ identifies with the persecuted Christians, with the church, his body. And so Paul here has this personal encounter with Christ in which Christ reveals himself to him. And he then goes to Damascus, his, his eyes are blinded uh, and he needs to wait there. In the meanwhile, uh, God calls Ananias uh, as a Christian to come and minister to Paul. And so uh, he says, uh, if, if you have a Bible, we can read from Acts 9 verse 10 onwards. There was a disciple in Damascus called Ananias, and he had a vision which the Lord said to him, Ananias, when he replied, Here I am, Lord, the Lord said, Get up and go to Straight Street and ask at the house of Judas for someone called Saul. He has come from Tarsus. At this moment he is praying and has seen a man called Ananias coming in and laying hands on him to give him back his sight. So, in a vision, um, God is calling Ananias to go to Paul and minister to Paul. But he also reveals that Paul is praying and um, he is seeing a man coming and he is seeing Ananias coming and laying hands on him. So, in other words, Christ is ministering to Paul while he is awaiting the arrival of Ananias. And so, Paul, while he didn't walk with Christ like the other twelve, has first-hand knowledge of Christ because Christ is ministering to Paul uh, uh, from the moment he met him in, uh, on the road to Damascus and continues to minister to him while he awaits the arrival of Ananias. But in response, Ananias said, Lord, I have heard from many people about this man and all the harm he is doing to the holy people in Jerusalem. He has come here with a warrant from the chief priest to arrest everybody who invokes your name. The Lord replied, Go, for this man is my chosen instrument to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And then Ananias went. He entered his house and laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, I have been sent by the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here so that you may recover your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. It was as though scales fell from his eyes and immediately he was able to see again. So he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. And after he had spent only a few days with the disciples in Damascus, he began preaching in the synagogues. Jesus is the Son of God. And so Paul, um, Paul became a missionary actually uh, before he met any Christian except Ananias. And he, he's, he's not, he hasn't heard the gospel from uh, the apostles. He has never met any of the apostles. Uh, in fact, uh, from his other letters, we know that it only take, it will take another three years before he meet, ever meets uh, Peter. Uh, um, but Paul already becomes a missionary because Christ has appointed him 
uh, as revealed to him personally and as revealed to Ananias because uh, to Ananias Jesus says um, this man is my chosen instrument to bring my name before the Gentiles eh? he is the, the apostle to the Gentiles so while not one of the twelve and also not a replacement of Judas uh, although uh, uh, some would suggest that well he, he seems to be taking more one of the one of the place of the twelve because Math Matthias we never hear of him again in in the Bible but uh, Apostle uh, Paul is all over uh, the New Testament so uh, uh, and and his feast day is always involved together with Peter uh, Peter and Paul uh, they are uh, the great missionaries uh, that went to Rome so Paul refers to himself always as an apostle elected by Christ uh, appointed by Christ not by apostolic succession not by replacement like uh, Matthias who took over Judas place uh, but simply uh, appointed first hand by Christ to become the apostle to the Gentiles the third apostle further is not much used uh, in the New Testament in Ephesians it, it, it seems to be one of the offices of the church uh, uh, but we don't find many names of people who are called apostles uh, I think Barnabas once and Titus also once uh, uh, but generally it's the twelve and Paul um, this replacement that we just read of Judas being replaced by Matthias the replacement in some sense continues to happen but not a replacement as in the number remains twelve uh, and then the replacement is an apostle and uh, so the development of the church as we also find and uh, the root of that uh, the, the first indication of that in the letters of Timothy and Titus is that the replacement of the apostles will be the bishops and the bishops the overseers they will be the successors to the apostles um, uh, by 120 AD and uh, that is already very clearly uh, the custom of the church as we find in the letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch and so uh, uh, the term apostle is not used anymore for anybody at this moment uh, at least not in the Catholic Church uh, but uh, rather that uh, the, the success of the apostles would be the bishops so Paul like he does in many of his other letters in these uh, three verses uh, uh, starts with his authority that he uh, writes this with an apostolic authority because he is an apostle of Christ and he refers then to himself as a servant, as a bond servant, as a slave of God. Uh, um, Note that um, a slave in the sense that God, uh, he fell to the ground when he met Christ. Uh, uh, Christ came to meet him. He, he took the initiative uh, and then Paul responds and, and he freely comes into the service of God. Uh, but with his whole life. And there's no turning back there's never getting out of the service of God and so he refers to himself in a positive way as a slave to Christ and his whole life and work is totally in the service of God for the sake of the truth for the sake of the fate of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that is in accordance with godliness so his mission is for the sake of those whom God has chosen uh, and will respond because we know that God has chosen all but uh, it, it, it may not be so that all will respond to the call of God and so those who respond to the call of God are called the elect and uh, because God knows already who will uh, accept his um, offer of salvation and who will reject it and so for the sake of the elect uh, Paul is an apostle to bring them to the knowledge of the truth that is in accordance with godliness uh, here again the, the, the word that we only find in the pastoral letters Eusebia uh, devotion religion or godliness which is both uh, a dedication to God uh, but also uh, uh, it has a horizontal dimension of being in a right relationship with fellow human beings 
And it is being in a proper relationship with God and with others. And that is true godliness. In the hope of eternal life, that God who never lies promised before the ages began. So, when we accept the truth and we start living the truth in charity, uh, um, God gives us the hope of eternal life. Yeah? Life without end. Yeah, so, in the hope of eternal life, that God who never lies promised before the ages. And so, we, we see here the, the both extremes. Uh, or, or rather the, the, the non-existent extremes of eternity that it has no beginning and it has no end. And the hope of eternal life, life without end, uh, but it was already promised before the world began, before the ages began, uh, in other words, also eternal. Because it is the eternal plan of God, the eternal plan of God uh, to bring His elect to salvation. This is the plan of God who never lies. Uh, uh, he always speaks the truth. In fact, he cannot lie, uh, uh, because uh, 1 John 14, uh, 1 John 4 verse 16 says, "God is love," uh, and if God is love, then God can only speak the truth, because uh, to lie would not be love. Uh, and as we had seen already in 2 Timothy 2 verse 13, um, that God is always. Uh, he cannot deny himself. Uh, uh, even if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. He is always true to himself and therefore he, he must and will always speak the truth. And before, the, before the time began, in this eternal plan of God, we also find in Ephesians 1 verse 4, uh, um, and the idea of before the ages or before the foundation of the world, as we also find in, in John 1 1, uh, uh, simply is a, is a referral to eternity. Now while this plan was from eternity, it has been revealed in due time, in, in the right time. And so while it is an eternal plan, the revelation of it is in the right time or in other uh, parts of the scripture we find that it says in the fullness of time. And God has a pedagogy of, of reaching out to his people starting uh, with the covenants uh, of, of with Adam and Eve, with Noah, and then with Abraham, he's, and he reaches out to individuals, and then he reaches out to one nation so that he he can live close with them and inspire other people that they want God to. But these are all foreshadowing of the Christ who is to come at the fullness of time and who will fulfill all of God's promises at the right time, at the proper time, when the time was right, and so. Uh, this was uh, um, when Christ was born and when Christ died on the cross. That was the fullness of time. Uh, 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 during the Roman Empire, um, uh, maybe so because uh, there was a very strong sense of the Messiah would come. And so uh, there was a, a certain ripeness for the acceptance of the Messiah to come because there was an eager awaiting of the Messiah among the Jews, but also because the, the, the Romans uh, had conquered quite a, a large extent of the world, or at least of, of, of the known world, uh, uh, and there was the Pax Romana, there, there was the peace of, of, of the empire. So when, 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 when Christ then started sending out his apostles, uh, and, and after his ascension they would travel, there, there was, it was very easy in some sense uh, to spread the good news because of uh, the roads because of the uh, the Pax Romana which allowed for traveling and so uh, God chose that time to send Christ as the Savior and, 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 in, and in, in a very short time um, and Christ was known throughout and, um, the known world uh, all, all around the Mediterranean and sea, Northern Africa, uh, Southern Europe and, and Israel uh, and, and, and from there it went further, uh, even towards Asia. Uh, I think St. Thomas came to, to, to India and, and this, this way. The addressee is Titus, uh, I've already mentioned him, and then he's a collaborator of, 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 of Paul and, and his, his role. Um, 
and he, he, he was also sent to Corinth to, de to deal with the troublesome group and then he was sent to bring the collection of the poor to Jerusalem from Corinth and so he was a very trusted collaboration of Paul and he calls him his true child which probably means that and Paul himself was responsible for Titus conversion and so to Titus my lord my loyal child in the in the faith we share grace and peace or mercy grace and mercy from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior here um, the last line of, of verse 4 says that Christ Jesus our Savior and if you go back to verse 3 it says that uh, uh, the command of God our Savior so God our Savior and Christ our Savior and the same term is used uh, this uh, um, uh, already is a very clear indication that Paul considers Jesus to be God and that God uh, um, the Father and Christ Jesus his son and they are one uh, one God uh, the Holy Spirit is mentioned somewhere else, but uh, the, the, not in this text uh, we already see the Trinity, but at least the, 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 the two persons of the Trinity are equally God. Verse 5, I left you behind in Crete for this reason that you should put in order what remained to be done, and should appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And elders says here the Greek word presbyters from which we get the word priest. Some Someone who is blameless, married only once, whose children are believers, not accused of debauchery and not rebellious. For a bishop, as God's steward, must be blameless. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or addicted to wine or violent or greedy for vain or greedy for gain. So, as I said, there, uh, Titus was sent or left behind in Paul uh, in Crete for the reason of appointing leadership and the way that he puts it in, 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 in a play on words in Greek um, that I left you and to put in order what remained to be done and so the appointing of leadership the putting in of structure uh, uh, the putting in, is a putting in of order and, and, correct, and Paul is always in favor of order we, we see this in his and first letter to Corinthians chapter 14 uh, when he speaks about the charismatic gifts uh, but there must always be order and they must be used uh, within order in, 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 in the creation story Genesis we see also that uh, the whole way that, that, that God creates though he creates from nothing uh, is a way of ordering of putting things in order when the Spirit of God is at work there is always a putting in of order and so here uh, Titus is entrusted with this mission of putting in order and which means uh, to appoint leaders first called presbyters and uh, the elders and then in verse 7 uh, the bishop uh, uh, the, the episcopos and uh, the overseer but the, 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 the term for uh, for a bishop uh, seems to indicate that actually he's talking about the same uh, type of uh, the, the same people so uh, he's kind of using these two terms at this point still very interchangeable bishop and priest kind of being the same uh, although there may have been some differences we don't we, but we wouldn't know uh, but along the way uh, the development becomes that uh, the bishop uh, um, is the higher ranking than the presbyters, the presbyters are many, and the bishop is the overseer and in charge of his presbyterate. Uh, that was already so uh, uh, by the time uh, of the letters of uh, in St. Ignatius of Antioch. And so, which means that since he doesn't write it like that, then this letter is unlikely to be any later than 110 AD, uh, and it is even an argument in favor of that Paul wrote it himself. Now the criteria for the presbyters as well as for the bishops uh, again are very, uh, uh, are very similar to the ones that we found in 1 Timothy 3 to, to 4 and so the qualifications are uh, virtually the same. Blameless doesn't mean that they are without sin because else nobody would have been a leader. 
Yes. Uh, but uh, but it, it, it kind of refers to uh, there should not be any uh, public crime or dishonor uh, for which he, that person is known else and nobody would listen to that person. And so in that sense, blameless. Married only once, uh, um, or, or literally actually a one wife man. Uh, uh, we have also referred to this before uh, in, in the letter to Timothy, in the first letter to Timothy. Uh, St. Jerome, Chrysostomus, and the Christian tradition have understood this phrase in the sense that not re of not remarrying after the death of one wife. And so they are married. Uh, if, if they are married, they are married to one wife. If their wife dies, they don't remarry. That has become uh, the consistent um, tradition of the church, uh, not only in the Catholic Church, but also in the Orthodox Church, uh, who, where there are married priests, uh, but if their wife dies, or even in the Catholic Church, we have married deacons, if their wife dies, they cannot remarry. Uh, you can only... Uh, uh, Married already, then you can you can be ordained. But if you enter the ordination unmarried, after ordination you cannot marry. Um, so if you're not married, then you have to be celibate. And if you're married, if your wife dies, you cannot remarry. Uh, uh, the likely theological basis of Paul for this requirement is that marriage is an icon of um, of Christ and His Church, as we see in this Ephesian letter. Uh, chapter 5 that Christ is married to the church and so Christ has only one wife and so since the the representative of the church the bishop the priest and uh, who uh, and, and for us uh, uh, now that we have celibacy and um, yeah, that our priests and, and our bishops are celibate uh, uh, becomes an image of the bishop the priest marrying the church um, if, if, if then they would remarry then it kind of breaks that image of Christ uh, being married to the church, uh, that Christ only has one wife, and therefore uh, uh, here the emphasis again is that uh, married only once. Since uh, at this point, uh, because um, uh, the requirement of celibacy in the West is still a long way off, um, though uh, already in 380 AD, uh, the requirement that candidate unmarried before ordination must remain celibate. Um, and, but and it's still a development to come to the uh, requirement of celibacy, which is not so much a dogmatic rule, although it has um, some theological component to it. It's not just a mere rule. Now, because they, they, uh, at this point they uh, are allowed to be married, uh, therefore they also have children. So, their children must be believers, they must not be accused of debauchery and not be rebellious. So there's, and the standard now for the, 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 the priest, the bishop, uh, is also uh, to see if they are children are followers of Christ and they are not um, living a licentious life, an unrestrained sexual uh, life, and they are not rebellious, they are not disobedient. Because if, if as a father he cannot even take charge of his own family, of his own household, uh, and he cannot bring his children up in the faith and, 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 and get them to be uh, obedient and, and, and live uh, a proper life, then again people would question the authority of that leader because uh, uh, well you can't even do it at home then what are you telling us so uh, um, uh, again uh, there, this was an additional standard of course children may turn out badly even though it's not always the fault of the parents uh, uh, but then still if they if this person is placed in charge of the church and it would give many people an excuse not to listen. So, and therefore, it, it, is, it is some kind of a practical sense that even though sometimes it's not your fault, uh, but uh, we don't want to have anybody having any excuses of not uh, listening to you. Another reason also uh, is a more practical reason that if your house is not in order, then your priority should be your house. 
don't be don't be uh, uh, the bishop or the, the priest of, of, of the community uh, uh, looking after everybody else while your own family is uh, um, walking away from God and trying to get everybody into heaven and your family is uh, going um, the other direction so the priority must always first be the family and I think that um, while here uh, many instructions that we read today are again for the leaders of the church they do uh, um, they do in some sense also apply to us because many of them are very general rules uh, um, we too uh, as, as, as active in the church as, as, as missionary disciples and, and some of us may have leadership position in the church in, in ministries or, or at least an active role we too uh, should live a holy life so that we can be an example uh, to others uh, else uh, uh, if we are not an example then uh, we may actually lead people away from God we may become an empty testimony and so here again also our priority should be our family yeah, if we are married if we have children our priority should be our family if our house is not in order and then we can put all our time and effort in church and, and we can always be in church but if our children are walking away from God then our priority uh, should be uh, our children and, and our spouse uh, uh, when, uh, when at the end of our life we have to give an account for our life uh, uh, surely uh, the, the account to, towards our family will be a much higher responsibility that God holds us to than what we have done in the parish. So a bishop, verse 7 here, is also a, a, a steward, um, which is a term that we see uh, um, an, an image that, that Christ used many a times in, in the Gospels, like Luke 12, uh, that uh, uh, the owner of the house leaves and he appoints uh, a servant, a steward, over the house to look after the house, to look after the servants, and uh, to make sure that the running of the house uh, is done responsibly. Uh, in that sense, the bishop uh, uh, is a steward of the house of God uh, until Christ returns. So the steward must be blameless against, uh, not that he, he has absolutely no sin, but uh, at least no gross vices. And, and, and some of these gross vices follow here. And he must not be angry, uh, arrogant, quick-tempered, addicted to wine, or in fact addicted to anything uh, of violent or greedy for gain. Uh, because all these things uh, are not helpful for being a leader in the church. You're arrogant, nobody listens. If you're quick-tempered, uh, always get angry. Uh, uh, you will make you you will break the unity of the church. If you're addicted, uh, uh, your addiction is an anti-testimony of the freedom of Christ. Violent uh, breaks unity. Greedy for gain. Uh, you are in it for the wrong reasons, and we, we will see later uh, that, that the, the false teachers are in it for the, the greedy gain, as we saw in in, in, in the lesser Timothy. Instead, and now seven uh, virtues, seven good characteristics follow. Um, he must be hospitable, a lover of goodness, prudent, upright, devout, and self-controlled. He must have a firm grasp of the word that is entrusted in accordance with the teaching so that he may be able both to preach with sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict it. And so, uh, as we also saw in the letters of Timothy, uh, Paul uh, keeps on making this distinction between uh, vices and virtues. Uh, don't live a life of vice, but live a life of virtue. And what are, what are some of these good virtues that we need to learn to be hospitable? That means a, a lover of outsiders, we need to have a welcoming um, embrace of those uh, who, who knock on the door, on our doors for spiritual help and material help. Are we willing to help? Are we willing to reach out to people? Um, are we welcoming? Yeah. Are our ministries welcoming? Are our communities welcoming? Are our neighborhood communities welcoming? Or uh, are we so close-knit 
so inward looking that nobody dares to join? And, or are we always reaching out, welcoming people in? Because I think hospitality is, is a key characteristic if we want to be missionary disciples, if we want to be evangelized. A lover of goodness. Uh, uh, not even moved to think evil, uh, uh, but simply wanting the right thing. Prudent, uh, uh, the virtue of, uh, um, of temperance. That means uh, to be reasonable, sensible, keeping one's head. Uh, um, the leader of the church uh, may, may often be confronted by, uh, by conflicting agendas, and so it needs to be level-headed, it needs to be reasonable. Uh, and he needs to be prudent, upright and devout or holy and just. Holiness means living a life that manifests one's consecration by the blood of Christ, uh, uh, devoted to Christ uh, uh, who made us holy. And self-control. Uh, self-control refers to the regulation of appetites in regards to food, drink and sex. And uh, for the Christian, self-control is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, if uh, referring to demons and, 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 and the devil, uh, we often use the, the, the term possessed. Uh, of course, that is the last stage. Uh, uh, first, the, the devil tries to tempt you. At some point, there, there may be a, a situation of oppression, and, and, and at some point, that may lead to possession. Possession uh, means that you have lost your free will. Uh, um, because that is what the evil spirit wants. The evil spirit wants to take over and, and make you lose your control, your grip on life. Uh, but when we follow Christ, when we follow the Holy Spirit, we will always grow in self-control. Uh, that uh, while Christ becomes the Lord and Master of my life, He always keeps waiting upon me for me to respond, for me to give my yes every day, time and time again, because uh, He's not... We are not possessed by the Holy Spirit in, 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 in this demonic sense that we have lost control, but rather uh, the Holy Spirit helps us to grow in self-control. That means we can take charge of our life, we grow in freedom. Okay. Not, not the Hollywood freedom to do what we like, but the freedom that the freedom as, as in an ability to do the right thing. A person who is free to do the right thing, this is really the opposite of the addict that we have heard uh, which we heard earlier on in verse 7. The addict is one who is not free. A certain sin, a certain inclination, uh, whether it is um, food or, or sexuality or, or shopping or, or workaholism, uh, any addiction, and, and, and unfortunately, I guess we all suffer some form of addictions in our life, uh, but uh, Christ. Uh, must set us free from addiction and when we are set free uh, that is the true sense of freedom because now we are free to say no the addict is no longer free to say no uh, he's doing what he likes but he's not free to say no uh, so it, uh, this is the, the, the real sense of christian freedom to to be able to simply say no to wrong and to say yes to the right thing to be free uh, and this sense of self-control and finally uh, uh, he must have a firm grasp of the word that is trustworthy. Uh, uh, he must know the word of God. He must know the message that he needs to teach. Uh, uh, the sound doctrine, the deposit of faith, so that he can pass it on, that he can preach it uh, faithfully, fruitfully, uh, uh, and that he can refute those who contradict it, which is the false teachers. And so he must be... Uh, able to faithfully pass on the apostolic tradition the deposit of faith verse 10 there are also many rebellious people idol talkers and deceivers which are the false teachers especially those of the circumcision they must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for solid gain what is not right to teach and so here we see here that he should not do it for solid gain and they want to do it for solid gain they have made religion into a money-making business. And of course, uh, the worker of the church is worth its wages, uh, but not for the sake of becoming rich, uh, uh, not for the sake of money, but for the sake of the love for the gospel. 
In the pastoral letters, uh, time and time again, we see that this problem of the false teachers uh, who simply speak idle. Uh, they, they just speculate and speculate, uh, but it doesn't lead anywhere. Here they are also referred to as those of the circumcision. Uh, um, we could question if these are non-Christian Jews, uh, because uh, the circumcised are Jews, uh, but it is more likely that these are uh, converted Jews, they are they're Christian, uh, Jewish Christians, um, but still uh, of the opinion that everybody should become a Jew first. They must be silenced. Uh, uh, their message must not uh, let these, these endless speculations, these deceptive uh, talk that, that leads people away from the faith uh, uh, must be silenced. Uh, and, and no longer preaching circumcision but baptism uh, because in Christ we are set free. They must be silenced because they are setting whole families. Uh, uh, we saw this also in Timothy. Uh, they like to go from house to house and um, upsetting families, leading women away from um, from the gospel. Uh, um, and, they, and if you dis destabilize the family, then you destabilize the church. And that is why uh, the, the, the enemy, the devil, always likes to attack the family first. And I see that, and I think that in, in, in the age that we live in, and this has become very apparent, uh, um, that a normal understanding of what family, of what marriage is, uh, to even believe what a normal marriage is, uh, uh, is by many now considered a, a discrimination of everybody else. Uh, so it, it, it seems to have become an opinion for which, you, for which people, some people are even fired uh, or, or lose their job uh, because they believe in traditional marriage. Uh, um, and so uh, uh, we see here the, the demonic power taking over this idea of what marriage is and if you break down marriage you break down society you break down uh, you destabilize the church uh, of course the church will still uh, survive and conquer uh, because the gates of heaven will not overpower her but and uh, we, we see here uh, the, 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 the spiritual fight that we are in verse 12 it was one of them their very old prophet um, Actually, he's a, he's a poet, uh, but uh, in the Greek world, they were often called prophets. Uh, uh, the very old prophet who said, Cretans are always liars, vicious brutes, lazy gluttons. That testimony is true. Uh, quite an interesting uh, sentence, especially for those who study logic, because uh, actually it doesn't really make sense. Uh, if a Cretan says, Cretan are always liars, so then is he speaking the truth? Uh, um, so. Logically, actually, the sentence doesn't make sense. Uh, um, but Paul still says, well, it is true. Uh, uh, now, again, it doesn't mean that all Cretans were liars. Uh, in this, uh, because now, by now, uh, Timothy is reaching out to many Christians uh, in Crete uh, who have come to the truth. Uh, but again, uh, referring to these false teachers. Um, and we see that in the next in the rest of verse 13 for this reason rebuke them sharply and them is the false teachers so that they may become sound in faith not paying attention to Jewish myths or the commandments of those who reject the truth so <clears throat> the problem here in Crete uh, um, and of the false teaching uh, is uh, much more than, than, than in some of the other letters the problem of the false teachers was the, the Gnostics uh, uh, here is much more the Judaizers the, because they are paying attention to Jewish myths uh, um, all kind of explanations uh, ex uh, uh, extra biblical uh, non-canonical Jewish literature that have all kind of speculations about biblical characters uh, um, sometimes uh, uh, sources outside of the Bible can help us uh, but if, 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 if they become the source of speculation and then they, they, they start to distract us from the Word of God they start to distract us from the, the preaching of the gospel and then they become the enemy of the gospel 
the commandments or literally uh, regulations of people, the precepts of men, uh, um, are likely the Jewish ceremonial practices and, or the human precepts or, that Jesus spoke about in Mark 7, 7. And all kind of um, regulations of washing hands, that they had to wash their hands until their elbows and, and, and the cup so many times before you can drink it. Uh, um, all these, uh, because there was Ten Commandments, there was about 600 over uh, rules to help the Jews understand the Ten Commandments and then there was a thousand over rules to understand those 600 commandments uh, and, and, and it, it got into details that and she are not helpful for living the Christian the Christian or, or even for the Jews the Jewish life at all it would not lead them to God and so uh, since these laws are all about purity uh, he continues then to say in verse 15 to the pure all things are pure but to the corrupt and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Their very minds and consciences are corrupted. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their actions. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. And so we, we see the contrast uh, uh, from verse 10 onwards with uh, verses 5 to 9, which are the good qualities that are needed for the priests and the bishops. Uh, uh, here are, uh, we see how the false teachers are uh, the, the bad example because they are corrupted, uh, unbelieving, uh, um, their minds are, their conscience are corrupted. Uh, um, you corrupt your thinking, your mind, then slowly your conscience will follow. A conscience actually is that place, uh, it's a sacred place that God gave us uh, in which God communicates with us directly the truth uh, for our living, what is right and what is wrong. Uh, however, when we continue to fill our minds with wrong teaching, with, 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 um, with unholy things, and we continue to corrupt our mind, then, uh, our, consci then our consciousness becomes darkened, and we cannot really uh, listen well to God. And then in our conscience, we may start to think that what is wrong is right. Um, and take, for example, the great... Uh, the great, great evil of abortion, uh, the, the killing, the slaughtering of, of innocent uh, children in the womb of their mother. Um, it is so clearly an evil. Uh, I think that it is really one of the worst evils that is around on the world. Uh, and yet, so many people, uh, uh, millions, are convinced uh, that it is the right thing. In fact, most governments around the world have come to this conclusion that it is the right thing, uh, uh, it, it is a human right. So, uh, um, and the thing is that they are not, these are not, um, they, they are not thinking, oh, it's an evil and I want to promote something evil. It's not, not like that. It's rather that they think it is something right. Uh, those who are in favor of abortion, or at least most of them, are not so much in favor of it because they think, uh, anyway, it's wrong, but it doesn't matter, it's wrong. But rather that they feel it is a good thing. Their mind, because of them, the corruption of their mind, now their consciences have become corrupted, thinking that what is wrong is right, so much so that they will defend it almost with their life, or at least with the law. If we corrupt our thinking, then uh, the danger is that our conscience may also be corrupted. Uh, and so, we have to form our conscience. We have to inform our mind uh, with the truth of the gospel, with the truth of the teachings of the church, so that we can, and so that our conscience can be clear, uh, can be enlightened, and so that we believe the truth. Yes. Yeah, so uh, what is the question? So is abortion... Uh, of, of course then abortion is still not allowed. Uh, there is the, uh, the, the right... Uh, the, uh, we have no right to kill uh, somebody. Uh, uh, because this, at some point in our, uh, the same comes with euthanasia. We, we are suffering in this life. We have, uh, 
we have abnormalities. We, uh, what people now start to introduce this term, uh, quality of life, and isn't really there. Then do we have the right to simply slaughter somebody? No, we don't. Uh, if, if we don't have the right to kill somebody who is 30 years old, 60 years old, 90 years old because they because they're suffering, then we don't have the right to do it uh, nine months uh, in that nine month period before the person is born. Because the person is as much a person in those nine months as the person is after. Uh, if we cannot... Um, uh, what if you didn't know that, uh, that your child was uh, deformed uh, in, in the womb and now uh, uh, is born and so uh, the, the, the nurse put, puts the baby in your hands and. It, and, 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 and this child is suffering, uh, or may live a very difficult life, may, may even die prematurely. Uh, we don't have the right to, to slice the throat of that child and say, well, uh, there's no quality, let's kill the child. If we don't have the right to do that one, one minute after the birth, then we don't have the right to do it nine months before the birth. Uh, because the life of the person is exactly the same. Huh? We, have, we have to protect the life uh, um, of anybody, treat any person with dignity and respect, and no matter what, and no matter what. And so, uh, uh, abortion in, in, in no uh, circumstance uh, should be allowed. Uh, that is the, the teaching of the church. Uh, of course, we can uh, protect the life of the mother. It doesn't mean that we commit abortion, uh, but we have the right to protect the life of the mother if the life of the mother is in danger. So if we, we, we give medication to the mother, we help to protect the life of the mother because uh, the pregnant mother, the life is in danger, and then we, we, we have the right and even some obligation, unless the mother sacrifices the life for the baby, to protect the life of the mother, that, 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 uh, because that life is also has an innate dignity. If as a result of that, the baby passes away, but not it is the intention to kill the baby, it's not, we're, not, we're still not committing abortion. Uh, but we're simply protecting the life of the mother and uh, of course uh, that is allowed uh, but abortion and uh, the intentional killing of a human being uh, in, uh, is never uh, uh, the right thing to do and, uh, the killing of the innocent is never the right thing to do so and then uh, Verse 16, the problem is that they, they, they profess to know God, uh, but they deny Him by their actions. And they claim to know God, uh, as many people do, but their actions don't match it. Okay? So we see that faith in God must always go hand in hand with deeds. Okay? Our good work, our, our life must fit uh, what we believe. If we really believe in God, there will be transformation of our lives that will show that we are true believers. Uh, um, and we, we, we either are a testimony uh, uh, by our actions to our faith in God, or we are an anti-testimony. Titus 2 verse 1, But as for you, teach what is consistent with sound doctrine. Tell the older men to be temperate, serious, prudent, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. So, now he, he goes to the instruction of uh, what he needs to teach two different groups of people in the church. Uh, the older men, the older women, the, the younger women, and the younger men. So all the men need to be temperate, serious, prudent, uh, uh, which are all virtues that uh, uh, probably will come with old age. Uh, we become, hopefully, if, at, least if, at least if we uh, mature in faith and we will become more temperate, more serious, more prudent. Uh, but and then it comes to the more theological virtues. Uh, they will also grow in sound faith, in love, in endurance, uh, which uh, uh, for Paul has very much to do with hope. Uh, because if we have hope, then we will endure. So faith, hope and love. Uh, likewise, the older women Likewise, tell the older women to be reverent in behavior, not to be slanderers or slaves. To drink, they are to teach what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be self-controlled, chaste, good managers of the household, kind, be submissive to their husbands, so that the word of God may not be discredited. 
So if we live a life of virtue, then we are a witness of the gospel. If we are not living a life of virtue, if we're living a life of vice, then we discredit the gospel. And at some point, things may come to the light, then we become an anti-witness. As, as we've seen in, 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 in the in the child sex scandal of, 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 of the priest of the clergy uh, in Europe, in America, uh, and other parts of the world, um, and when these things come out, uh, when 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 the preachers of good news uh, are living a life totally different, then uh, that becomes also an empty witness. Again. Of course, none of us are perfect. Uh, we are all sinners, uh, and so uh, we must at least not claim to be perfect, uh, but also uh, be honest that we are all struggling. Uh, I am struggling, uh, um, but uh, Christ is changing me, is, uh, is at work in me as He is in you. So, the older women need to be reverent, uh, uh, this this Greek word uh, uh, outside the Bible, especially about fitting uh, uh, the conduct of fitting to a priest, a priestess serving in a temple, and so here used here it suggests that women consecrated by baptism should manifest that consecration in how they dress, speak, act, perhaps even suggesting that their role, especially in the household, is an act of worship, of liturgy, and uh, for what they are, they are part of God's temple. And they uh, should show this sense of reverence, which uh, is, is the gift of piety, uh, one of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. They should not be slanderous, uh, uh, not speak bad about people, not gossips, um, but rather speak good about people and not uh, enslaved by addictions. Uh, here, um, zoomed in on drinking. Not that drinking uh, alcohol was not allowed, uh, we already saw that. Uh, um, he even told Tim Timothy to drink a glass of wine uh, for his health, uh, but not enslaved to drinking and to getting drunk. Because when we are drunk, then we lose self-control, uh, and therefore drunkenness is always a sin. They are to teach what is good, eh? and then in verse 4 we see that this teaching is especially to the younger women. Eh? The, the, the women, eh, <coughs> especially in, in the culture of, of Paul's time, eh, were those in charge of the household. The man eh, was working outside, providing for the household. The woman was the manager of the household, as we see in verse 5. And so, in that culture, eh, the, the, the means of education uh, is one of apprenticeship. Uh, if you want to be a carpenter, you learn from your father who is a carpenter who teaches you how to be a carpenter. Uh, if your father is a fisher, he teaches you how to fish. Uh, in the same way, the mothers, uh, they would teach the younger women how to be mothers and how to take care of the household. Uh, and so here we see this, uh, that they are the teaching, they are encouraging the young women how to become mature women. Uh, we lead by example, we teach by example. Uh, of course, uh, in, 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 our, in our culture, uh, many women uh, may not be the one in charge of the household and many uh, uh, may have a job and, and that is okay, but we still must live by example and we still must teach by example and, and as women and especially as if you're a mother, uh, that remains your primary call, that is your unique calling and, and so We can teach by what we experience. And so as um, married people, we can teach other married people, uh, or younger people, how to be married people, how to love your spouse, and uh, how to love your children. And uh, are we leading a life of example? Uh, to be self-controlled again, and sensible, discreet, or temperate, um, chaste. Uh, so, in other words, uh, uh, this especially in the area of sexuality, uh, to live a life of chastity in according with our calling. And chastity uh, uh, is not the same as abstinence. Uh, chastity uh, for the unmarried person is, uh, of course, 
will be lived in abstinence uh, from the sexual act, but chastity within marriage uh, is uh, uh, lived in, in, in the faithfulness uh, to your spouse. And so there are homemakers, uh, but here uh, the addition to the word good means uh, that they are not uh, uh, supposed to exercise their authority like tyrants, but rather with gentleness and understanding. Uh, um, here we see submitted to the husband because the, head, uh, the husband is the head of the household. Um, uh, actually, the, the Greek word is rather uh, to be subordinate as we find in Ephesians 21. Uh, in Ephesians 5, 21 verse 25, we see that uh, while we found there also the call to be subordinate to the husband, uh, there is also a call to be mutually submissive. Uh, um, the submissiveness to the husband is not uh, a submissiveness to an evil person who wants to dominate you, but rather uh, uh, a submissiveness to his call. And what is the call of the husband is to be like Christ who died for his bride. And so a submissiveness to the one who is laying down his life for you, because that is the calling of the husband. Uh, uh, else it becomes a, a dangerous submissiveness or... or, or an, uh, a scary submissiveness, uh, but if uh, you know that you're submitting to the one who is laying down his life for you, uh, then who wouldn't want to be submissive? Uh, uh, because uh, this is submissiveness to love, to, 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 to receive uh, this love of the one who lays down his life for you. Verse 6, Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled, show yourself in all respects a model of good works, and in their teaching show integrity, gravity and sound speech that cannot be censored. Then any opponent will be put to shame having nothing evil to say. To, to say of us. Uh, so uh, we had the older men, then we had the, the, the older women, then the older women are teaching the younger women and now it comes to the younger men. To the older men and women, the instruction is to tell them what they need to do and Titus needs to tell them, for in verse 6, uh, uh, for the younger man, he doesn't, he, he's, he doesn't need to just tell them, he needs to urge them. So there's a little bit more uh, uh, stronger word here. Uh, the didactics of reaching to the elderly uh, is different than to the young. And uh, the young can be challenged uh, um, and can simply be taught and, and urged. And so they too need to be urged to self-control um, to live a, a, a model of good works, uh, which includes teaching um, with integrity. Uh, that means, uh, uh, I think yesterday's teaching was, 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 was about hypocrisy. Uh, uh, the daily reading of the Gospel yesterday I think was about the hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is we teach one thing, but we do the other thing. We, we are not living what we preach. Uh, uh, here, uh, we need to practice what we preach then we preach with integrity. And so uh, the sound speech, uh, uh, which actually, um, if, if we speak, if, if we preach sound doctrine, uh, then uh, it cannot be censored. Uh, uh, the speech that cannot be criticized incorporates a legal term which can also be translated free from censure, meaning that an accused person is declared innocent. The Christian message itself must not be corrupted by infidelity to the apostolic tradition and thus incur the censure ultimately of Christ the judge. Eh? True teaching must not be uh, kept away from others. It must not be censured, but it must be proclaimed. So who is this opponent uh, who we put to shame and has nothing evil to say of us? Eh? This could be Satan, the accuser of all, it could be the Roman authorities or the false teachers uh, whom Paul, uh, who Timothy needs to silence. Lastly, uh, uh, because he's instructing the older men, the older women, the younger women, the younger men, uh, and then the last two verses. Uh, uh, this is not the end of the chapter because we'll continue the, 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 the chapter next week. Um, but at least this part uh, is... Slavery again comes up. 
uh, uh, we've spoken about it before, uh, that the Jewish, uh, the biblical idea of slavery is very different uh, from the slavery that probably comes to our mind when we think of uh, uh, the, the African people being brought to Europe, being brought to um, America uh, against their free will. Uh, that was not the type of slavery that the Bible talked about. Not that the Bible so much uh, is in favor of slavery, condone slavery, but simply that uh, it was a culture already around uh, in the New Testament and the emerging church at that point is not clearly speaking out against it yet, uh, um, but rather giving some instruction of how they should behave uh, uh, so that they can be a witness of the gospel as well. Okay. Tell slaves to be submissive to their masters and to give satisfaction in every, in every respect that they are not to answer back, not to pilfer, but to show complete and perfect fidelity so that in everything they may be an ornament to the doctrine of God our Savior. And so again, uh, they should be submissive, uh, uh, give satisfaction, and do their best. Uh, um, and, um, many uh, uh, Many of the slaves of the New Testament and may also have been voluntarily enslaved, meaning that, or, or not so much voluntarily, but in the sense that they, they were indebted, and they, they had a debt to somebody, they're paying it off and by becoming a slave of somebody until at some point they are set free at the seventh year. In that context, uh, they, they, if they are submissive, if they, if, they, if they do their best, they're not just doing the minimum, but they are giving extra, and uh, then uh, uh, all the more they become a witness of the gospel. Because now that my if my slave has become a Christian, and then he has, becomes more and more disobedient, he starts to run away, and he starts to do uh, lazy things, he starts to steal of me. Then why, as a master, would I want to follow the religion of my slave? But if I have uh, if, if, if a master has slaves, and this slave. Now that he has accepted Christ, doesn't steal anymore, doesn't lie, and is obedient, and, and, and in fact, is serving me even better than he did before, then actually maybe uh, the, the master may be inclined to now follow this, uh, the Christ that uh, the slave has encountered. So uh, for the sake of evangelization, uh, um, doing our best, uh, uh, I think for us maybe we can apply it to, uh, if you are working, are, are, are we stealing of our boss's time? Uh, are we not doing our best? Or are, are we giving extra? Uh, because ultimately we are not serving our boss, but we are serving Christ. Uh, then maybe we can also uh, become a witness uh, uh, of Christ uh, to the one that we serve, uh, our boss. Uh, then, uh, and then in that way, uh, we can evangelize. So today, again, uh, uh, many things that we heard about leaders uh, and, and the qualities that we need for leaders, uh, again, for the witnessing of the faith. Uh, against the false teachers who live a life of vice. And then in, 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 in verse, in chapter 2, uh, we see how different categories of people in the church, uh, the elderly man, the older woman, the, the younger man, the younger women, basically all, uh, even slaves, uh, how all of us uh, need to live a life uh, of prudence, of faith, of love, of endurance, of faithfulness, uh, of self-control, uh, of faith, hope, and charity, and uh, living a life of virtue, then we can, uh, by our deeds, uh, already become a witness of the gospel, uh, so that hopefully we can proclaim Christ uh, to those whom we encounter. So let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this letter of Paul to Timothy, uh, to Titus, in which again he is called to put order in the church, Lord. May we, who are active in this parish, also put order in this parish as we serve in our place, first in our families, but also in the in the fam your family, the church, the, in the parish. That we also may serve the good news by living a life of virtue instead of a life of vice. And Lord, where we are still addicted to sin, where we are still struggling with our own weaknesses. Lord, may the victory of Christ on the cross set us free. Lord, bring us to that freedom so that we can become more and more a witness of the faith. We make this prayer to Christ our Lord. Amen.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.